But like I said, Hebrews chapter uh, 8 this morning, I want to talk to you for a few moments about why the New Testament is better. Why the New Testament is better. So Hebrews chapter 8, let's look at verse 1. It says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the, set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the, uh, in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on, on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. We serve unto the example and, and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished, admonished of God when he was uh, about to make, uh, make the tabernacle. For see, uh, for see, saith he, that uh, thou make all things according to the pattern showed uh, to thee in the mount. But now, <clears throat> excuse me. But now uh, hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have, have been sought for the second. For finding, uh, for finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days, uh, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the to the covenant that I made, that that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Uh, uh, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my uh, laws in their mind and write them uh, in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they, sh they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me for the least, uh, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their, iniqu uh, and their iniquities will I remember no more. In, uh, in that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the, the first old. Now that, uh, now that which, is de uh, which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit this morning. Lord, I pray that we had ears to hear your word. And God, that we would, uh, that we would do your word, that we would um, hear something this morning. Like, Lord, that that would cause us to just draw closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So obviously up until this point, the focus of the letter to the Hebrews has been on Christ. It has been on what he has you know, done, that he is superior to the, to the prophets, he's superior to the angels, he's superior to Moses. And you say, well, duh, God is, you know, Jesus Christ is going to be superior to those, uh, you know, to those people. But the superiority of his uh, priesthood to the, to the Levitical priesthood, with, with this, obviously in the first six verses of this chapter, we see a transition happening. It, 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 it takes that focus and it shifts it from, sorry, shifts it to the New Testament, to the New Covenant, a new covenant in which Jesus has already been described as the surety. That, uh, the word surety just means the guaranteed security. In uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22, it talks about the surety. Well, that's a guaranteed security. And then uh, we see in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, it's, he refers to him as the mediator. Obviously, a mediator is just a person who intervenes or intercedes between two parties at variance from the, the purpose of reconciling them. That's the, uh, that's the Webster's Dictionary uh, uh, def uh, definition. Basically, a mediator is who? There's two parties arguing and bicker, uh, bickering with one another, and that mediator comes in and tries to, you know, tries to bring peace to everything. Well, we know that Jesus Christ did that. Why? Because there, it, there was a difference between God and man. And Jesus Christ is that mediator that was able to, to reconcile and bring those things through, uh, you know, uh, about through his uh, death, burial, and resurrection. That he had to die so that way we could be saved, that way we could go. And both these you know, passages... 
this covenant was described as a better covenant. That the New Testament is, it has, is described as a better covenant. Well, it's better than what? Better in what way? Well, in Hebrews chapter 8, we learn that answer. Verse 7 says it, that it's better than the first covenant. Verse 6 says that it's better because of the promises that are contained in it. The key word, in, obviously, in Hebrews is the word better. We've seen that word often, you know, oftentimes, obviously, he's saying that Jesus Christ is better. He's better than you know, Moses. He's better than the prophets. He's better than all these things. That's why I said at the beginning of this, if I was going to you know, name this entire series, it would be, he is better. Because that's the, that's the simplest way of, of saying what Paul is trying to tell the Hebrews. He's better than what you used to believe, than the old covenant. He's better. And Paul, you know, he, he's, he's going on and he's telling them why that's, why, that's, why that's true. Why Jesus is better than the prophets. Why he's better than the angels. Why he's better than Moses and Joshua and Aaron and all the different prophets that we see. Jesus is a superior high priest to the Old Testament uh, priest. Hopefully today, you know, we will discover why the new covenant established by Jesus Christ is better than that old covenant. Our, you know, obviously, if you've been a believer for any a period of time, you know that the Bible is divided into two parts. The Old Testament and the New Testament. Or the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Verse 6 is actually you know, the key to understanding this entire chapter. Verse 6 says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. It not only declares, obviously, the theme for the chapter, that Jesus is better in these ways, he tells us you know, the reason why that we see these things. This chapter it, you know, seems to be built upon the truths that are found in that verse alone. But let's read those first you know, five verses before we get into it. And number one, I want to talk to you about that Jesus Christ has a more excellent ministry. He has a more excellent ministry. Let's look at verses one through five again. It says, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum, or this is, you know, this is the sum of all things. I'm going to summarize it for you. This is what Paul's saying. He's saying, you know what? I'm going to summarize this whole thing for you. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Who is he speaking of? Jesus Christ, right? He is that high priest, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. Obviously, in the Old Testament, the minister was what? The high priest that would go into the Holy of Holies, right? And in the tabernacle. But it says this one is not the one that, the, you know, this, is, this one is the one that the Lord has pitched and not man. It says, uh, for every uh, high priest is ordained to offer gift, or they must get, offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. So in other words, he's saying, you know what? Jesus, you know, should offer something, right? Because the thing is that if, he's, you know, if we're going to claim that he's the high priest, this great superior high priest you know, more than anything else, he should have something to offer, right? And so that's what he's going on. In verse 4 it says, For if he, uh, he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Why do they have to do that? To obtain what? Forgiveness of sin, right? Verse 5 says, Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things, that make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. And so when we see this, in, uh, you know, in chapter, and when, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go back a little bit with, you know, chapter 7 and then, you know, in chapter 8, kind of going back and forth because he's obviously expounding upon that. So in, in chapter 7, we talked about the superior priesthood of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek rather than the order of Aaron. Why? Why is Jesus after the order of Melchizedek rather than Aaron? Well, Aaron's priesthood was faulty. It was not perfect. Melchizedek's was. That's the reason why I went at length trying to show that the reason why I believe that Melchizedek was an Old Testament appearing of Jesus Christ. Well, who else has a, you know, who's, who's perfect? Jesus Christ. He would have a perfect, sac, uh, you know, a perfect priesthood. And the Bible talks about the fact that Melchizedek had a perfect priesthood. 
And so we see how this goes in there and that obviously that Aaron's Levitical priesthood was flawed. It was imperfect. But Melchizedek's priesthood is perfect. And that's in uh, verse 19 of chapter 7 that it talks about that. The words most excellent in, in uh, verse 6 refer to a different kind of ministry, a ministry that far surpasses the old. And the one that Jesus Christ was the only one that would be able to accomplish it. No man would, able, no man would be able to ever accomplish what Jesus Christ accomplished. His priesthood is superior to the Old Testament priesthood. Jesus, you know, Jesus' ministry is, look at it this way, Jesus' is, uh, ministry, when he, uh, upon his death, burial, and resurrection, his ministry is completed, is finished, Right? His ministry, everything he did is completed and finished. We see that in verse 1 of chapter 8. When Jesus entered into the, uh, the heavens, he sat on the, the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. It's set. It says that he sat down, it's set, it's, it's done, it's accomplished, it's finished. Whereas the Old Testament high priest work was never finished, it was never set. You say, well, how do you know that? Because they had to keep on offering sacrifices. Over and over and over again. I you know, talked about it a few weeks ago, how horrible it had to be back in the Old Testament because the thing is, is that most of them were farmers. They were, they were into agriculture. They had you know, uh, cows and everything else, and they had to do certain things. Well, if they sinned they messed, you know, and messed up, they had to go, come here, Bessie. And they had to go take Bessie out to the, out to the woodshed. I mean, and just, you know, and, and that would be the way that they would atone for sins, right? And so for, for them... It was something that they physically saw happening. For one thing, they probably saw part of their livelihood going away because every time they sinned, they had to kill something. They had to kill an animal, right? And so, but Jesus Christ came and he says, you know what? You don't have to do it anymore. He says, mine's completed, mine's finished, it's all done. That's what he means when he, when he dies upon the cross. He says, right before he dies, he says, it is finished. You don't have to keep going back. You don't have to keep on you know, over and over again, you know, sacrificing for sin. Why? Because he was the perfect sacrifice. That Jesus ministers from a greater place. He, he, he ministers from heaven. He doesn't minister from an earthly tabernacle. He ministers from heaven, a better place, a greater place. He, uh, you know, this tabernacle that's in heaven is the true tabernacle, like I said, that is set up by the Lord and not by man. If we set it up, what's going to happen? We're going to mess it up, aren't we? But God sets it up, and it's going to be perfect. It's going to be amazing. It's going to uh, do those things. The third, you know, what we need to realize is that before Jesus, you know, uh, died for our sins, Jesus now, when he dies, you know, that when, that when he died for our sins, he presented a better offering. Okay? He presented himself. The Levitical priests offered what? The blood of bulls and goats and other animals like pigeons and all that. Jesus offered himself. If you want to, uh, let's flip back you know, to Hebrews chapter 7 and look at verse 27. And this is something that, you know, that I want us to, you know, to get and to understand is the fact that oftentimes people say, well, the Old Testament, all they had to do was you know, the blood of bulls and goats, that took care of the forgiveness of their sins, that's all they had to do. If that was a good enough system, it would have stayed in place. But it wasn't. And so verse 27 of chapter 7, it says this, Who needeth not daily as those high priests, uh, high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, sins and then for, uh, for, the, uh, for the people's. For this he did once when uh, he offered up himself. Well, think about the part where he says at, at the beginning of that. He says, Who needeth not daily. Old Testament Blood of bulls, goats, birds, whatever, all those animals had to be done what? Daily. And the priest was sinful, so what he had to do? He had to offer you know, an animal for his sins first, and then he, would have to, uh, then he would have to offer for the people, back and forth. So but what does it say to Jesus Christ? He's the perfect sacrifice. He only had to be offered once, and that was it. It says, you know what? It says that he did this once. That's the reason you know, why, like, you know, if you go on, and we're going to see this here in a moment, is that um, is, is the, the fact that your uh, salvation is secure. Why? Because if you have to keep on 
asking for forgiveness. You know, you say, Jesus, I lost my salvation. I, I lost it. I lost it. I lost it. What you're saying is, is that you're going back to the old sacrificial system where you have to keep on offering Jesus up over and over again, that his sacrifice is not enough. And the Bible clearly says that his sacrifice is enough, that his blood is enough to wash us and make us clean, right? And so that's the reason why we look at uh, these parts. I want, now I'm going to you know, uh, give you a little preview for you know, next week on this one. I want you to go over to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And this is just further showing the point that bulls and goats, that old covenant did nothing, all right? Did nothing, you know, to help us. So starting at verse 11 of chapter 9, it says, But Christ being a come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and calves, or sorry, by the uh, blood of calves and goats and calves. I'm going to get it right here in a moment. Goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, think about that part. It says he entered once to do what? To purchase our salvation. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more should the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to uh, serve the living God. Verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So he goes on to say, you know what? That his blood does what? His blood purges everything, all of our sins, right? He bought our sins. He paid it all, as we saw this morning. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe, right? He paid it all with his blood. That is the reason why your salvation is secure if you have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, because he did it once, and he did it for all. His sacrifice was was so perfect, so great, that it only needed to be done once and not daily. There's a reason why the second temple has been destroyed. Because that's where the Jewish people would go all the time to do what? Make their sacrifices, right? They'd have that high priest over there. He'd atone for his own sins, and then he had to go for the people. He destroyed it to show them that you don't need that temple anymore, that there's no more sacrifices that you need to do because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. That is one reason. You know, if we're going to go through, you know, through this, is why the New Testament is better. Think about it. He was offered once, and that's it because he's perfect. But we don't need to, you know, like, you know, uh, some out there, you know, believe the fact that you just, you can lose your salvation, you stub your toe, you say a bad word, you do something like that, and all of a sudden somehow you lose it. Well, you know what? If you lost it, then that means you got to do what? You got to do another sacrifice, and then another sacrifice, and then another sacrifice. Jesus Christ paid it all. He did it once and for all. That's the reason why your salvation is secure. Okay? Make sense? Because if you do it over and over again, like I said, if you have to sacrifice over and over and over again, his, his sacrifice is not perfect. You're saying his sacrifice is just the same as the blood of bulls and goats. But the fact is, is that he did it once, and he did it for all, and he says, you know what, that's it. That's all you have to do. And then you know what you need to do? You need to receive him for, you know, for salvation. And that's what you got, right? And so... His, obviously, his ministry is infinitely better. His blood is a sign of the new covenant. He offered himself not an animal. He didn't need to. He presented the value of his own blood. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't do that. He took away your sins. He didn't merely just cover them up. He didn't just go, okay, just put them over here. Just don't look under that blanket. All right? He took them away. He gave uh, believers a perfect conscience, not an annual reminder of sins. That's the thing is, is that when uh, when we got saved, the thing is, the the Bible now uh, is saying, that the fact is, is that because you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you now have a perfect conscience. Why? Because you don't need that annual reminder of saying, you know what, you messed up again, you messed up again, you messed up again. But Jesus paid it all. 
He opened the way for us to enter into God's presence and to not stand outside at a distance. Now think about it. Not everybody was allowed to come into the Holy of Holies. There's only one person. It was the high priest. Now we're all able to enter God's presence. Amen? Number two, Jesus Christ is the mediator of a better covenant. He's a mediator of a better covenant. Let's look at verses 6 through 7. It says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how, uh, how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been what? Faultless. Then should uh, no place have been sought for, a sec- for the second what is he saying there, right in that verse? Right in verse 7, he said, you know what? If, if me killing animals was perfect, if that was the way to do it, why do we need a second? Why do we need a new covenant? Why do we need? Because Jesus Christ, everything that he did is, uh, is enough, and what it was before was not perfect. It was not good. So, but if you look back in, in, uh, in verse 22 of chapter 7, where it says, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant. Remember, that's a guaranteed security. His covenant is a secure covenant. And so when it says, by so much was Jesus made a surety or a guarantee of a better testament or a covenant, the New Testament is superior to the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus is the mediator of the superior covenant. He's the mediator of the new covenant. The word mediator, as we said earlier, is somebody who, in, uh, who intervenes or intercedes, uh, who intercedes between two parties. Here's also the other thing. Jesus is your intercessor. He not only intervenes, he's not only your mediator, but he's also in your intercessor as well. And so when we see these things, he has reconciled us to God. That mediator is a, a, is a means of communication. It's an arbiter or someone who acts as a guarantee. Jesus is the surety or the guarantee of that better covenant. That's what it means. The word better, because sometimes people say, well, that's better, this is better, everything's better. But the word better, it simply means having good qualities in a greater degree, uh, greater degree than the other, applied to physical, acquired, or moral uh, qualities. Basically, it's more, uh, it's more acceptable, it's more safe, it, it's just, it's better, right? That's what they always you know, promote every single time you see a brand new phone come out. This is better than the last one. This one's better than this one. This is why you need this one. Well, Jesus Christ, it's the best. There's nothing you're ever going to do that's superior. You're not going to find a better covenant. You're not going to find a better Savior. Why? Because he's perfect. He's, he's, he's the epitome. He's the better covenant. He's the one. The covenant, like I said, is an agreement between God. And this is the way that it was in the Old Testament. It's an agreement between God and the, uh, the ancient Israelites in which God promised to bless them and protect them if they faithfully kept the law God gave them. So in the Old Testament, when you're seeing that covenant being talked about, God said, I'll protect you, I'll bless you as long as, what? As long as you, uh, as long as you keep the law that I give you. What did the Israelites do? They did not keep God's covenant. They kept on, you know, just doing their own thing. We were just talking about it, you know, a little bit this morning. You always see, you see Israel at one point. They're, they love God. Everything's going well. God blesses them and he protects them. And then all of a sudden they decide, you know what, God, we got this. We don't need you anymore. We're going to do whatever we want. God says, okay, really? So what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring a nation against you. It doesn't matter whether they love God or not. You know, they could be, you know, wicked like the, you know, the Ninevites or anything else. And God says, you know what, because you've all of a sudden turned your back on me, I'm going to bring somebody else into the picture to make sure you get your, your, your act together. And so he'll bring in, you know, some heathen nation to get everybody to, you know, begin to act right. It's kind of like, you know, the fact that we, you know, nowadays people say, well, this is not a Christian nation anymore. Well, it was. It was based upon God's word, right? And so... But the thing is, is the act of rebellion that we have against God in this society. Is the fact that all of a sudden now people are like, well, you know, uh, everything that they do, they want to do against God. What he has ordained, what God has said is right, what is perfect. So you say, you have a baby in there. Well, you know what? That's a cute baby. We should kill it. That's the society's view. Or the fact that, you know, uh, know, they just begin to look for ways to do it. They're like, oh, traditional marriage, man and a wife. No, we should change that to where you can be 95 different genders. 
and go against what God has, or the fact that you go against nature, or the different ways. I mean, think about all the disease that we have, a lot of the diseases that we have, and this is proven. I'm not just making this up. The things like, you know, the AIDS virus, or like monkeypox came from what? Somebody doing something that was unnatural to an animal. That's a nice way of putting it. But that's the way that both of those diseases came about, was that way. There's a reason why recently they wanted, we can't call it monkeypox because then people will remember how it came about, so they want to give it a different name. It's kind of like the AIDS virus. The AIDS virus was originally, if you look this back up in the 80s when it first came out, it was known as the gay disease. That's what it was because that's how it started out because somebody got frisky with something that they shouldn't have, and that's what happened. So all these things are going against God's plan. This society that we have is going against God's plan. Somebody, God's word says, thou shalt not steal. I'm going to take whatever I can grab. That's what society says. Honor thy father and mother. I'm going to talk back, and I don't care. I'm going to, tell, I'm going to put my parents in their place. That's what society tells you. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm going to have every single God that I could possibly think of except for Jesus Christ. That's what people, you know, in this society have come to know. I mean, there's so many times. I was actually watching uh, this last night. Um, the, the head of PragerU, Prager University, puts out a lot of good stuff out there, a lot of good, you know, thing about America and all that kind of stuff and where we started off. So they asked him the question. They said, why are you Jewish and not Christian? And basically every single one of his answers to it was, I mean, he came out and says, you know what, I don't believe, he says, I believe there's a Messiah, I don't believe there's a Savior of all mankind. And it was everything the opposite of what the Bible actually teaches. He says, yes, I do see that there's, you know, there's this, this, this in the Bible, he says, you know, that's, you know, uh, that's shown, but I don't want to believe that, I'd rather be this way. And it's, it's the epitome of, yes, he puts out there this great content, but the thing is, is that for the most part, you can't have a safe society, a God-fearing society without God. That's what everybody wants to do. Every single politician that's out there, this is not a political issue. This is the fact that every, everyone wants to try and do stuff apart from God. They want to do stuff apart from Jesus Christ. They're saying, you know what, we can have a civilized society if you would just let us rule over you completely instead of God. Right? Right? That's the reason why they want to get rid of all the, all the, all the rights that were written down in the, in the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and all those. Why? Because they actually used the Bible to make those. The same thing with the laws. They want to you know, reverse laws that they say, oh, that's just racist. That's this. You know, whenever somebody uses the word racist, it's that they're trying to trigger you into the fact of feeling sorry about you know, for somebody. It has nothing to do with that particular law, that particular plan, or anything else. It's the fact of, you know, if I don't go along with this, because I remember this. Back in 2008, Barack Obama was running for president, right? I didn't agree with him, okay? I'll just tell you that flat out. This is not a Republican-Democrat debate, okay? I didn't agree with him. He came from Illinois. I'm originally from Illinois. Nothing good comes out of Illinois, as far as politicians-wise. The last good politician was Abraham Lincoln. That was it. And I just know, I was like, every single you know, politician that comes out of Illinois is absolutely corrupt. They're out there to do something. I was like, I'm not voting for him. I was told, because I held that view, I was racist. Not because of his policies, but because of the fact that, you know what, if you didn't vote for the, you know, the first black president, which, by the way, he's not fully black, if you want to say that, because he had a family member that was white, the other one that was black, and whatever, so that's besides the point. I didn't vote for him because I didn't agree with his policies. It wasn't the fact that I was racist. I could care less what color you are. You could be purple or pink. I don't care. You could have, uh, you know, you could have polka, uh, polka dots and be green. I don't care. But the thing is, is what, you know, the, you know, the policies, the policies were wrong. I was like, I'm not voting for him. Of course, I didn't like my other, you know, thing with Mitt Romney either. I didn't, you know, sometimes, you know, when somebody says a lesser of two evils, remember, if you're saying I'm going to vote for the lesser of the two evils, they're still both evil. Right? Some are going, Pastor, are you going to vote or, you know, you just, I'll let you, you know, you do what you got to do, I do what I got to do, all right? Let's just put it that way. But like I say, the lesser of the two evils, still evil. Right wing, left wing, is still a part of the same bird. 
That, none of that's in my, in my notes. That was all free for you right there. But that's the whole thing is, is that this society in and of itself has bent on the fact, and I could I actually, I, you know, this is the perfect word. This society is actually hell-bent on going against what God wants. They want the things of hell to radiate the things of this world, and they're saying, you know what, we can do it apart from God. That's the reason why later on, when the rise of the Antichrist happens, people will willingly take the mark of the beast. Why? Because he's going to promise them peace. He's going to promise them all those things that the politicians say that they're going to do and never do. He'll be able to do it for a short period of time, though, while he's getting everything ready. But that's the reason why you're, you know, you'll have friends and family members that you've known for years. You know, they're, probably, uh, they're probably along the lines of, you know what, I love you, I'll do anything for you, I'm glad that Christianity is working out for you, it's just not for me. Those ones, and they'll sit there and willingly go, I love this guy, he's amazing, and all of the time you're going, what are you doing? That's the Antichrist. Stay away from that guy. And they're like, what are you talking about? This guy is, you know, this guy is amazing. You say, how do you know it's a guy? Because the Bible refers to him as a man, all right? And they're going to willingly go up there. I mean, there's a reason why there are people that will see a certain political candidate. They don't care what they are. They just have voted a certain way for, for decades, and they're like, I'm going to vote for this person. I don't care, you know, if they come out and say that they're going to kill me tomorrow. I'm voting for them because they're a part of this party. It's, it has gotten to that point. Back to my original message. That, you know, like I said, that covenant, it refers, obviously, the Old, Test the Old Covenant or the Old Testament and the New Testament, the, Old uh, you know, the New Testament or the New uh, uh, Covenant. It refers to a sacrificial system in covenant making. God established a covenant with Abraham. The initial sign was the rite of circumcision. That's how you were shown you know, that you believe God's covenant. You were circumcised. The men were. God promised to make of Abraham a great nation, and he did. Both the Old and New Covenants were based upon the sacrificial system. Under the Old Covenant, the sacrifices had to be what? Constantly repeated. It wasn't something that just ended. The basis of the New Covenant is the blood of Jesus Christ, which secures for us our salvation. It was done once and for all. It doesn't need to take place again. How do we show that sign in the New Covenant? It's the Lord's Supper. When we take communion, we're showing what? We're show, uh, you know, when we take, you know, the wine, what does the wine symbolize? The blood of the new covenant, the blood of the new testament. And his, bo and his, broken, bo uh, his broken body with the, uh, with the wafer that we take. But that's how it's shown. Is that sign, the sign on the New Testament is the Lord's Supper. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, like I said, is, this is the blood of the, what, new covenant or the new testament. The Old Testament was, or the Old Covenant was, but a copy or a shadow of the New Covenant. And you know what? Despite what you know, some people think, our shadows are not reality. That's what I think most, most people nowadays are following. They're following shadows. They're following promises that people can't keep. People will make a promise. They said, well, they promised. It's sad to say that a lot of times... Promises today don't have the same value that they used to 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. I mean, I, I still to this day, I'll go up to somebody, you know, come over. I think of, uh, you know, I had uh, some pressure washing done for, for the church and for the, you know, for the parsonage done. I just went up to the man and we came up to a prime price and what did we do? We didn't have to sign a big long contract. We didn't have to do whatever. What did we do? We shook hands. That was it. Nowadays, you know, for, you know, for a lot of people that you meet, you're going, your handshake doesn't really mean anything. Your promise doesn't really mean anything to me now. Because it's just like, just like, the, the, you know, the, like going back to the politicians, it's just like those promises. They'll make promises. Most of them, they can't keep them. Number three is this. The new covenant in Jesus Christ is established, a what? Upon better promises. The old covenant could never do what it needed to, uh, what needed to be done in, in sinful man. The fault was not so much in the old covenant, but it, as it was in the people's refusal to live by what God told them to do, by that covenant. The old covenant had been surpassed by the new covenant. Paul is quoting the prophecy that is given in Jeremiah chapter 31. Concerning the old, or sorry, concerning the new and different covenant, you know, let's look at these verses that he talks about. I'm going to be in Jeremiah chapter 31. It's going to start at 
uh, verse 31 through 34. It says, Behold, the days come, and he's pretty much going to say the same thing that he says in chapter 8. But it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the uh, covenant that I made with their fathers in the day th that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But, these, uh, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in uh, their inward parts I will, and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. They, they shall uh, teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. This is referring to the fact that it's not just one person that gets to go into the presence of the Lord. It's going to be everyone. It's going to be available to all. It says, For they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Aren't you happy about the last line in there where he says that he will forgive your iniquity and he will not remember your sin? God's laws has become an inward reality in the new covenant. It, 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 they're no longer written on tablets of stone. They're written upon our hearts. Psalm chapter 119, verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Romans chapter 10, verse 8 says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in uh, thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. God has placed that in our hearts. God and his people can have, obviously, that, inti uh, that intimate fellowship under the new covenant. Under the old covenant, like I, uh, as I've mentioned, the high priest was the only one that was able to go into the Holy of Holies. But when Jesus died on the cross, at that moment of his death, the veil in the temple that separated the, whole, uh, the holy place from the Holy of Holies was what? Ripped or torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that the way into the presence of God is now open to all who would come to him through Jesus Christ. So every time that you know you, you see something, you know, see something that's you know portraying Jesus as far as those things, you always see that temple go, you know, the, the big curtain being ripped and torn too. And what's the significance? It's showing that we all have access to the presence of the Lord. That we can that we can uh, that we can all come to him. The thing is, is that sinful ignorance of God was removed forever. That all, you know, that it says that all shall know them from what? From the least to the greatest. The good news of the gospel is that you can know God in a personal way. Is that not, you know, is that, I mean, does that not right there, just at one point, make the New Testament better, is that you can know God? I mean, think about this. The New Age movement literally says that you can, you can be God. There are so many cults and so many religions out there that says, you know what, you can become God one day. There's actually a, a false sect of Christianity which says that we are all little gods. And that's actually becoming more and more popular. I say it's a small sect, but it's actually getting larger and larger. It's actually take, overtaking more churches where it says that you can literally become a god. You say, well, why would they do that? You say, well, that's, not, that's definitely not, oh, yes, it's in the assemblies. Do you know Why? That's the reason why a couple of years ago I preached about Bethel Reading, because Bethel Reading was teaching that. But now more churches are, are learning it and teaching it and believing it. Why? Because somebody got on there, somebody with popularity or money has promoted it so much, they're like, well, it must be true. Just because you repeat a lie long enough does not mean it becomes the truth. And, and like, you know, Basically, long story, you know, the long story short of it, the New Age movement is just a new name for the same old lie of Satan in the Garden of Eden when the serpent said, you shall be as gods. The fact is, and everybody in here should know this, hopefully you guys know this, you're not God. And you should be happy about that. And you'll never be God, but you can know God in a personal way through Jesus Christ. That's the awesome thing is that I'll never be God, I don't want to be God, I never whatever, but the thing is, is that I can know him. That was something that blew me away when I was newly saved. Because 
I don't know if I share this part of my testimony with you, was the fact that I had gotten into a car accident. I got into a car accident, got rear-ended, and I was so mad and frustrated with all the stuff that had just happened because my car was brand new. It was like probably a couple months old, and it got, I got rear-ended. I had been going to church for a few months and whatever, and I decided that, you know, okay, that's nice, and I'll just do my own thing. So over the summer, I just did my own thing like, you know, a lot of people do. They take a you know, summer vacation from God. And I was like, I'm good. I got rear-ended, mad, because that's my vehicle, my stuff, mine. And it wasn't until later that night where I was laying in bed and I was just still fuming about the fact. And it was at that moment that I, you know, that I, I heard, you know, to me, I, it was probably, I was, you know, it was in my own head. It wasn't like a big audible voice, but the voice said, Sean, don't you know I love you? And I didn't, I didn't understand it right away. I was like, who is this? I thought it was, I was probably sitting there like talking to myself, you know, you know sitting there. I was going back and forth. I'm like, what? And I started, I like, argue. it's bad when you start, you know, not only when you start talking to yourself, but you start arguing with yourself or what you think is arguing with yourself. But then all of a sudden it just hit me. I said, wait, 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 because I realized who it was. It was the Lord. And the fact that he called me by my name, it wasn't like, hey, you, hey, you with the face. He said, Sean, and to me, that was huge I was amazed, uh, because up until that point, my idea of God was if there was a God, which I wasn't really sure that there was a God, but if there was, he doesn't care about me. And he's probably like that little kid, you know, with the magnifying burning ants and I'm the ant on the ground that he's trying to burn. That's the view that I had of God. But the fact that God actually called me by name, that he actually took the time out of his day in my mind and actually knew who I was is amazing. Don't ever take your relationship with Jesus Christ for granted. Why? He knows you. He knows exactly what's going on. You haven't slipped from his mind. You haven't. He's not going. Oops. Haven't really interceded for a long, long time. But the thing is, is that we, you know, we read in 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 chapter eight of you know verse twelve. Says for. He says, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember anymore. That reality that you can have your sins forgiven is an ever, everlasting reality. That's not something that we just make up or we just say just to make people feel better. The fact is that if you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you put your faith and your trust in him and you ask him for forgiveness... He will do it. He's not a used car salesman that's just trying to sell you something. Because you know what? He put himself on the line and he put it, and his words on the line. The blood of, of sheep and goats served only to cover up sin. It was only a shadow. It only just covered it so you didn't, eh, just leave that alone. Just don't go back to it. But the blood of Jesus Christ takes away your sin and cancels your debt completely. I sang it this, you know, we sang it this morning, we sang it as a church. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. How much more of a reality do we need that the New Testament is way better than the Old Testament? That does not mean that the Old Testament, you know, there are still parts of it that we need to follow, right? Like we follow the we, you know, we follow the civil laws and, and, and those things. Like, you know, I, I ran into, I met somebody, they said, well, the Old Testament is done away with, we don't need it anymore. I said, okay, so it's okay, you know, and they're like, because the you know, New Testament gave us everything that we need to know. That everything we need to know is in the, in the New Testament, we don't need it, we don't need to read it, we don't need to do anything with it. And I was like, okay. So do you think it's okay to marry your grandmother? Do you think it's okay to see your aunt naked? Do you speak it and whatever? And they're like, well, no. That's not talked about in the New Testament, but it is talked about in the Old Testament. Do you think that that's a good idea, that we should you know, keep those things? Oh, yeah, yeah. But don't say the Old Testament is done. You know, there are things that we still need to follow. There are still moral law that we need to follow, and the Old Testament tells us a lot of those things. But the New Testament is better. Why? Because Jesus Christ has paid it all. The fact that we don't have to sacrifice bulls, goats, 
you know, uh, maybe, you know, Rover, you know, or any of those. You, want to, you don't have to sacrifice Tweety Bird, okay? Jesus did it once and for all for all of us. And so I just end with this, is this. If you're not saved, then you don't know Jesus Christ. You don't know him, and the thing is that you're, you don't have peace. There's nothing that you, know, that you have in your life that's peace. You, this world is never going to give you peace, even though that you hear it. The Bible talks about there's people going to say, there's peace, there's peace, when there isn't any. There isn't any in this world. But Jesus Christ says, you know what? That he has overcome this world. And that he can give us a peace that passes all understanding. So if you don't know him, you can meet him today. You can start that relationship by trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that death, burial, and resurrection that I've talked about a few times this morning, that you can come to know him in a personal way. And some people will say and have, you know, uh, come along and say, well, Pastor, you talk about just that you've got to believe on the Lord. You've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. You know, where does it say that? And I've quoted it, you know, Acts you know, 16, verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, Right? Well, you know, people will, you know, will come oftentimes and say, well, people believe that there is a God. So they can just believe that there's a God and it's okay, right? Or that even believe that Jesus existed. But there's a difference between believe and believing in something. There's a difference between, well, I believe that that light bulb is on. Or the fact that I believe that this platform is going to hold me up. I believe in that fact. Because it's done it before, Right? There's a difference in that. There's a difference in, you know, the fact that, you, you know, oh, I believe Jesus. And there's a fact of believing in Jesus to save you is completely different. Belief by itself means to think that, some, uh, that someone or something is true. But when you believe in something, that means you put your faith, your trust in that person. So when I say, you know what, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, you're putting your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ that you know that he is the only one to save you and that you know it to be true, that he is the only one. That's the difference, that Jesus died on the, you know, on the cross for your sins and for mine, that he was buried and he rose again on the third day for what? For your justification, for, for you to be able to come to God, to be right with him. But when he ascended and he entered in uh, the earthly uh, tabernacle and presented, here's the other thing, that when he ascended, he entered the heavenly tabernacle and presented his blood on your behalf. Your blood ain't going to do anything, but his blood can wash you white as snow. For those that don't know Jesus Christ, Today, I'll say, today is the day of your salvation. Come to Jesus today. Let him forgive you, cleanse you, and make you new. You will say, well, pastor, I, I'm saved. I'm good to go. But sometimes we want to take things on our own, don't we? We want to do our own things. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, for, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The thing is, is that when we th start thinking we're doing our own, th you know, I got this. I'm, you're going away from the person that actually has reconciled all things for you. You're going away from that and saying, I can do it on my own. So the thing is, is that what we're doing is we're going to the things of this world. We're going to other people to trust in. I would tell you this. He is your mediator. Don't go to your friends, your family, your counselor, your HR rep, whoever it is, to talk about your cares and your concerns. Take them to Jesus Christ. And so this morning, if that's you, you say, you know what? I have so many concerns. I have so many cares. There's so many things going on in my life. I don't know what to do in my life. Take it to him. He said, well, how do I know he even cares? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Whatever your concerns, whatever your cares are, whatever you got going on in your mind, whatever the stuff that you've been, you know, that has burned you down, has given you anxiety, all kinds of things, all this weight upon your shoulders. Remember, the Bible says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He takes your sins away and he, whatever, he, and he casts them away. What you want to do is all of a sudden just start bringing stuff back on. 
And the Bible says, you know what? Get rid of that. Cast your cares upon who? Him. Why? Because he cares for you. And so this moment, at this moment, if that's you, you say, you know what? I've been, I've been, I've been burdening, burdening myself down. There's so many things going on. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how it's, I'm going to survive. You don't have to know how. You just have to know who can take it. Cast all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. And so this morning, if that's you, you say, you know, I got way too many burdens. I got all these things coming on me. I've been caring about all these things. I'm wondering how life is going to you know, handle. I got all these things. Don't worry about it. Give it to Jesus. You say, well, I have to know. I, you know, the creditors are calling me. Jesus will provide. Trust him, not your checkbook. Well, I don't know. You know, this person's always given me good advice in the past. Who better to give you advice than the one who made you? The one who sees you at your best and your worst. You say, well, that's my spouse. No, he sees you even when your spouse doesn't. He knows everything. He even sees those thoughts that you have that you don't want to say. You know, those inside, you know, those inside thoughts that you want to keep inside because if you set them out, you hurt a lot of people. Or am I the only one that has had that? Because there's sometimes when somebody cuts me off, I have a lot of inside thoughts, and I keep them in because I don't want to, you know. But that's you. You say, you know what? I'm tired of carrying all this, all this weight, all these cares, all this burden upon me. Come to the altar this morning and cast it upon him.